Hi, folks. Welcome to our Google Plus Hangout with the Buck Institute for Education. I'm John Larmer, Editor-in-Chief at BIE, and uh, today's topic will be uh, leadership, leading a PBL implementation effort in a school or a district. So we have a couple of great guests, so I'll ask them to introduce themselves soon. soon. But just a couple of reminders about logistics. You can um, watch this Hangout later on BIE.org in our uh, Hangout uh, archive, if you wish, or pass the word to friends. We'll go for about half an hour today, and you can post questions in the, uh, using the, the question feature there on the Google Plus events page. If we don't get to the questions, we might answer some later offline on the Google Plus page. But feel free to ask questions, and we'll, we'll deal with them as, as we can during the Hangout. So um, today's Hangout is uh, special in a way because we're launching a couple of Hangouts this month about a new book we're just publishing with ASCD. And it's called Setting the Standard for Project-Based Learning. And uh, I was one of the authors, along with John Mergendoller, the director of BIE. And it's a K-12 book about project-based learning, everything from uh, how to design projects and manage them for teachers, a, book about, uh, a chapter about uh, leadership, a chapter about PBL and out-of-school time, uh, informal learning and summer learning. Also, a chapter on the gold standard for project-based learning, a new model of, of PBL in terms of uh, project design elements, as well as project-based teaching practices, and a good chapter on the research behind PBL. So it's a great book. It's coming out from ASCD. It'll be available in our store uh, June 1st at bie.org slash shop. So you can check it out then. So Susie Boss, one of my co-authors, will be taking us through the Hangout today. And um, let's have Susie and Jen and Roddy introduce themselves. Susie? Sure, I'll go first. So I'm Susie Boss. I'm part of the national faculty of the Buck Institute for Education and delighted to be the third co-author uh, on this book um, and worked on the leadership chapter uh, where it gave me the opportunity to uh, pick the brains of some really smart folks and we get to talk with a couple of them today. So I think they're going to introduce themselves. All right. Jen? Hey, I'm Jennifer Cruz. I'm the Director of Implementation here at the Buck Institute for Education. I work with a team of systemic partnership coaches and we support school districts that are wanting to implement project-based learning across their system. And Roddy. Good afternoon, folks. My name is Roddy Boonchoy, Director of Professional Services here at BIE. I oversee our uh, service offerings and the national faculty that uh, facilitate our workshops around the country and world. Uh, came out of the New Tech Network, where I was a, a founding teacher and principal, uh, and also uh, uh, wrote my dissertation on uh, leadership for project-based learning. So I'll be sharing some of my own personal experiences as well as experiences of other PBL leaders out in the field. All right. Thanks for being here, guys. All right. So, Susie, take it away. Sure. So let's dig in. So let's start with the big topic of readiness for project-based learning. You know, if you're listening and you're a school leader, um, you may be thinking, is this a good fit for us? Are we really ready uh, for this sort of teaching and learning in our district? And so maybe, Jen, you could start by helping us think about that readiness question. How do leaders go about gauging readiness? And in your work with BIE, how do you kind of frame those conversations? It's a great question. So when when districts contact us and they let us know that they're interested in project-based learning, um, we, we ask them why. We, we want to know what their why is. And then we, we wonder who they have connected with to make sure that that why, that reason for project-based learning is shared. Um, and shared not just amongst the, the leadership of the school system, but truly shared across the community that, that makes up the system. So is it, is it broadly shared with students, with parents, with the teaching force? with you know, everyone that has um, what we think is a stake in what happens in classrooms. So we're, we're really hopeful that they have built a collective why. And then from that why comes a vision for project-based learning. So what will your classrooms look like? What will students experience? What will the community experience you know, after, after we've implemented project-based learning? And what are your intentions for shifting school from the way it currently is to that vision? How committed are you? Um, and really, it's a how committed are you to being a we in, in the process and moving the forward as a community? Okay, so it's a big conversation, it sounds like. Huge um, conversations, and, and we're really hopeful that those conversations have happened over time because to truly engage with that many people in a system and in a community really does take time to get there. So a lot of times, the interest comes from the process of having created a strategic plan. 
you know, a lot of school systems, you know, kind of embark on this journey of creating a strategic vision and a strategic plan. And we're really hopeful that, that this is the fruit of those labors. Great. And so just to help our listeners kind of understand, so being ready for PBL, does that mean you need to be ready to do all projects all the time? Or can readiness mean doing some projects some of the time? I mean, tell us a little more about what, what you described as being sort of all in about project-based learning. Sure. So we're, um, we're hopeful that there's an understanding of where the system wants to be and where the system currently is and that um, there's acknowledgement that it's a journey to get to that vision. So what, what that's going to look like in each system as you move in that direction really depends on their, on their vision and, and what the community, again, like what is, what is their tolerance? What, what does the teaching force want to see? What do students want to experience? What do parents want for their kids? What does the community want you know, for their schools? So um, we don't usually see districts um, start off with, with everyone, right, with every teacher. We typically see early adopters and, and then see some, some movement happen from there. So that's, that's what we're hoping for is that folks will start small and have some, have some small wins and, and really work as a team to figure out what is best for the, for the kids and for the community right now as they're implementing projects. So it's, um, it's a little bit organic. It's, it's, not, it's not really always a science. Okay. Okay, and in the, the chapter we, we um, use a lot of case studies to look at how different districts have come at this issue of um, growing their PBL vision and, and starting to implement. Um, I just wonder if there's anything in particular that comes to mind of, of strategies you've seen school leaders use to um, kind of help that conversation, that early conversation get going. Just as one example, I remember um, a couple of the school leaders we spoke with talked about taking folks on some um, visits, some site visits to see PBL in action. Um, is that the sort of strategy that can help this conversation or are there others that, um, that you've seen or that you might recommend? Well, we definitely want folks to create demand, right? There, there needs to be a reason to, to change. And, and we also need to really help people start to get that picture in their mind. What does this look like? What is it that you're really asking of me? So we love making school site visits, hopefully reading books and articles, you know, checking out videos online, um, you know, and really just kind of digging in with each other and making sure, again, that this vision is really crystal clear. Um, creating, a, creating a plan, a messaging plan, is something that we spend a lot of time doing with our partners up front just to make sure that, that um, the vision and the expectations are, are truly broadly shared, you know, that everyone can say, you know, the, the why, the what, the how, those big pieces of PBL implementation. Um, and we, we definitely want systems to partner. This, it needs to be um, this idea that we're creating a project-based learning culture. Mm. So, you know, that's a, that's a collaborative, deprivatized space. And I think Roddy can really speak to that, you know, from his experience. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make this systemic shift um, as opposed to a directive that's given. And Great. so how do you do that? Well, you got to be all in, right? Everyone needs to research. Everyone needs to learn about it together and, you know, maybe go to conferences, things like that. We see a lot of site visits, videos, and, you know, book studies and articles. Great. Great, great examples. Okay, well, let's bring Roddy into the conversation. Roddy, maybe you could start, um, tell us a little bit about the focus of your dissertation. I think folks might be interested in some of the research that, you know, has been going on about project-based learning, and you're specifically around leadership. So um, give us some high points, if you would, some highlights. Sure. I think uh, it, it was born out of the same question that we're asking for the purpose of this hangout now. What does leadership look like? What are the practices? What's the disposition of a leader, uh, particularly at the site level? And what stance do they take uh, to not only um, initiate project-based learning, but to advance it and to keep it going, to, to sustain it? Um, and so uh, what I did is uh, interviewed uh, uh, PBL principals all around the country from different organizations, from charter schools, from public schools. Uh, to capture uh, what PBL meant to them and what they did to um, to promote professional learning at their sites uh, to keep PBL um, keep PBL alive, to keep it fresh, and to keep it engaging, uh, since that is the uh, you know the overarching objective or intent for bringing that methodology uh, to the program. And uh, there were a lot of similarities in what principals um, said and, and did uh, to make uh, to make PBL work, and the barriers were also uh, quite similar as well. Uh, but what some of the general findings um, were that principals were uh, central to instructional leadership, that they were involved 
and uh, promoting and facilitating reflection among teachers. Um, we're asking teachers to make a significant paradigm shift in the way they think about and the way they act uh, in the classroom um, to uh, create more student-centered, uh, learner-generated um, learning experiences as opposed to the teacher being the sage on the stage. Um, so for uh, principals to do that, they had to, as you mentioned before, um, um, create a culture of deprivatization. So how do we make our practices uh, more transparent uh, to our peers uh, so we, uh, as a staff, can learn to change the way we think about instruction and the way students learn and the way we act in the classroom. Ways uh, to deprivatize uh, include uh, the use of, of uh, different protocols. Uh, so many folks are familiar with a critical friends protocol where we share our project ideas um, and elicit feedback on them. Uh, so if JL's a teacher, John Larmer and I are, are teachers, he knows what my project's about and we can better collaborate and understand how to support each other in the design of this new thing called project-based learning. Uh, looking at student work is critical for a deprivatization of practice. Uh, so we can, as a staff, make sense of how students are responding to project-based learning and come up with solutions to enhance the level of rigor, the level of critical thinking uh, that's happening in PBL. So principals and leaders have a, have a, a, a critical job uh, in promoting these types of conversations and these dialogues uh, within the staff in order to bring PBL up to the next level. Um, other ways that uh, leaders promote project-based learning are through structures. Um, as uh, many of us know, it's, uh, it's vital that teachers have an opportunity to spend time with each other, to collaborate, to share their experiences, and to plan. So how do you develop a schedule, um, a site schedule that allows for teachers to come together and share their uh, best practices and their thinking? One principal in particular had a, a genius idea, and that was to create a common planning space. He called it the bullpen. This was a, a school out in Idaho where all the teachers were in the same room. You, you had no... Uh, compartmentalization of, um, of classrooms. Everyone shared classrooms but had their desks all in the same room called the bullpen mm -hmm. and there they would be engaged in dialogue and, um, and talking about the, the work they did together. On a more practical level um, we saw a lot of technical modeling uh, from principals in PBL schools as well. So technical modeling would be um, I'm going to use driving questions for example uh, in our staff meetings. Um, or uh, we'll use the language of project-based learning, of the, of the essential elements um, as a leader. And that's fairly, fairly superficial in the beginning because we're just trying to normalize and make familiar uh, the types of uh, vernacular and the, and the terms we use. Uh, but that also leads to more uh, uh, in-depth uh, modeling of practices. So how do principals um, um, uh, cr uh, create learner-centered uh, inquiry or learner-centered um, uh, uh, experiences among the teaching staff in the same way that they expect teachers to promote in the classroom uh, with students? Or how do we take the same principles of problem solving uh, that, uh, that we expect in a project-based learning classroom and apply it to teachers as well? Mm -hmm. um, and you see that through data analysis and you know, these protocols that I just uh, talked about before, mm -hmm. um, facilitating that type of learning. Sure. And as leaders are doing this, do you think it's helpful for them to um, just be transparent about their purpose in doing that? It, to actually point out, you know, you may notice today's meeting is starting with a driving question. Um, is it good to, to be pretty overt uh, about that strategy, or, or do you think um, it just becomes part of the, the way you roll as a school leader? Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important to be over about that. Uh, BIE, we call that a meta moment, right, where we are cognizant of, uh, of our behaviors and our, um, you know, what we are doing to facilitate this learning experience so that we can reflect on not only the content of what we're talking about, but the process by which we learn that content. Um, and then I think over time, um, it becomes more a part of, you know, the, the collective disposition of the, of the staff. And you know, one more thing I want to add about modeling. There's a school down in Southern California that uh, does something fantastic, uh, and that is every year the principal or the site leader uh, will lead the entire staff through a project, a content-based project. Mm -hmm. um, one principal I spoke to um, took uh, her staff through um, a history unit um, and where they actually went out into the field, conducted interviews with community members and experts the exact same way the students would enormous commitment and investment in time, um, but a very powerful way to um, inculcate the principles and practices of project-based learning. 
uh, with your staff. If you actually experience it, you're more likely to adopt it and promote it as your own teaching practice. Mm -hmm. And I guess one more question, um, and we want to kind of shift topics again a little bit, but um, as leaders step into some of these roles that you're describing in model practices, um, do something like designing a, a school-wide um, project, um, it's a little bit risky. Uh, it's a little out of the norm um, for leadership behavior. Um, any, anything that you want to say about um, the uh, comfort level that you've noticed in maybe anecdotally in leaders who are more attuned to project-based learning? Are they more comfortable taking some of those risks? And do they, do they create a culture where risks are tolerated um, you know, among staff? Absolutely. I mean, if you, we, you might think of this as a parallel process. Ultimately, we want students to take risks in their learning and to, uh, you know, to be able to be creative in the solutions they come up with with projects and be able to rationalize why they did them. But sometimes you're going to fail, and we hope to fail forward. And the only way we can have students do that is if teachers are willing to take risks in the projects that they design um, and feel comfortable with that. And, then, and, and so to initiate that, our leaders must be modeling that type of risk taking. Uh, the, the principal, the leader, sets the tone uh, for the school, for the culture of the program. And if the leader is unable to take those risks and uh, be very transparent about when he or she uh, is taking that risk, it's going to be hard for it to cascade throughout the uh, throughout the stakeholders of the program. So yeah, so be transparent, be open, say, and, and, and be forthcoming. That. I don't know if this is going to work, guys, but this is, uh, this is what we can try to do. And uh, no matter what, we are guaranteed to learn from this experience. Right. Great. OK. So we've talked a little about readiness, modeling um, some of these great uh, behaviors and strategies. So let's say you've got your PBL initiative um, underway. Let's shift to the topic of momentum, um, because I think many of us in education have seen initiatives come and go over the years in education. So if PBL is something that we want to see take hold and really thrive and, and grow and become kind of the way that students um, learn and teachers teach, um, momentum seems to be a really key piece here. So for both of you, um, Jen and Roddy, could you talk a little bit about um, some of the key strategies that leaders can embrace uh, to, you know, keep good work going, um, keep the focus on PBL, um, not get kind of distracted by the next important uh, initiative that comes along. Um, whichever, whoever wants to jump in first, um, tell us some of your, your go-to ideas around momentum. We like at the, at the district level to um, encourage district leaders to as Ronnie was talking about, you know, the principal sets the tone and, and leads the charge, you know, for teaching course and models. We want central office leaders to do the same thing. And so we, we encourage them to create a, a change facilitation team or a, a PBL steering committee um, to support the growth of project-based learning and the culture that really supports project-based learning just becoming the norm how we do business. You know, a, a, a project-based learning outlook is, um, you know, it's a culture when it's, when it's how you do business then we find that that is a more sustainable, um, you know, instructional practice, right? Because it, it becomes bigger than just the person that brought this initiative in. And that's really um, what we hope. We hope that this um, truly is a shared vision, shared practice. You know, we're, we're supporting, you know, teachers side by side, you know, with other teachers, with other principals. Then it becomes the, you know, the way, the way of the world. And we think that helps make it be, you know, something that's, that's here to stay. And we also really ask leaders to take a good hard look at the things that we're asking of the teaching staff and of you know site-based leaders and you know are we are we creating initiative fatigue and you know, do you have so many different things happening that there's just absolutely no way that a person could reasonably do them all and have you grown really purposeful in showing how initiatives connect so if you have a standards-based grading initiative and you have a project-based learning initiative are those two completely separate things you know, if you have a performance assessment initiative and you have project-based learning, are those really separate things? Mm -hmm. um, so we really try um, and support leaders in thinking through the kinds of practices that they're hoping happen in their district and, and can build that connectivity, really be explicit in, in how these things are, are connected Great. to each other. Great. And Roddy, maybe you could talk a little bit at, at the building level. Um, some of the, the strategies that, that principals might um, embrace, you know, <clears throat> such things as what do you look for when you visit classrooms um, and how do you encourage the kind of PBL practices that you want to see um, 
in, in your observations, whether they're formal or, or more just informal walkthroughs. Sure. And Susie, I'm going to uh, throw in one more uh, insight from the first question about uh, maintaining momentum and getting that sure. going, uh, particularly at the building and site level. Um, one of the ways to really uh, develop uh, the, um, a critical mass um, um, uh, throughout your community is by being a community connector. Um, it's really important that a principal is, is a connector, is a liaison between the school uh, and, the, and the community at large, and that includes uh, local government, higher ed, the district office, small businesses, or other community organizations, and definitely your parent community. Um, that's, uh, that is how we uh, develop um, if, uh, political support, if you will, for the type of learning that's happening. By making the school and program transparent, by being inclusive of uh, various issues or problems or challenges happening in the community, you, uh, you build um, a, uh, a collective uh, vision for why that school exists, because these students are able to engage real-life challenges and issues, and we support each other. Uh, moreover, it maintains uh, a sense of relevance with the content. Um, if you want a thriving project-based learning community, uh, you got to have a meaningful, you know, meaningful content that the students uh, can see the value of. And that goes both ways, <clears throat> because not only does the community bring these experiences to students, but students give back to the community as well. Um, and that, that moral purpose is critical um, if you want a, uh, you know, a powerful, thriving um, project-based learning program. Uh, but to your question about um, 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 what, what, you, what you should see in the classroom, um, this, this is a tough one, I think, uh, particularly when you're coming out of a, a, a traditional paradigm uh, where the teacher uh, has uh, control over the classroom, command, both command and control, uh, you often see uh, students engage uh, individually or independently uh, in work. And in a, in a project-based learning classroom, uh, it's, not, it's very common to see a, a controlled chaos, uh, if you will, because uh, with the amount of voice and choice, with the amount of creative uh, license to address and tackle uh, problems um, based off of, um, you know, student-generated ideas, uh, you're going to see different, you, you could potentially see different things happening from workshopping uh, to collaborate, collaborating students and teams uh, to individual work, to multiple projects happening, multiple types of tasks happening uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a principal, it's, uh, the way you, you reconcile that is being able to engage with the students and ask them, what are you doing? Justify your activities and, and, and the tasks that you're working on. And ultimately, it should lead back to this overarching driving question for the project. Everyone doesn't need to be doing the exact same thing, but it is important that students um, have that level of engagement through their interactions with peers, their interactions with You know, Susie, when it, when it comes to looking in classrooms, you know, we really do want to encourage teachers to be risk takers. And so, you know, we try and caution against um, going in an evaluative way at, at the beginning of this practice. Um, we want people in other people's classrooms. We're real champions for that, and we really do want to deprivatize practice. Um, but, but at this time where there are so many issues surrounding accountability, I would certainly hope that, you know, central office leaders and, and site leaders in, in some of, you know, some systems would have those conversations with teachers and, sure. and make sure that the, the intentions are well known and, you know, that, that there's a, a willingness to engage together. Um, right. And we do like it when, when we can take, as a teaching faculty, the evaluation instrument and, and genuinely look at it and say, you know, where in my practice can I see project-based learning teaching practices reflected, you know, in this tool, if this is something, you know, that a system is really tied to, that they can really see, you know, when, when I'm, you know, doing this high-quality instruction, then, you know, there's, there happens to be this side benefit, um, you know, showing some of the pieces that are in an evaluation instrument. Great. Okay, great. And so, um, you know, both of you have touched in different ways on just the importance of kind of everyone kind of understanding the purpose of what this is all about. And by everyone, I mean, um, you know, all your stakeholders, um, community members, et cetera. And Roddy, it was great that you brought up kind of the community connections that are so important. Um, but can you talk maybe more broadly about how you kind of continue to tell that story so that they are, your stakeholders are, are part of what's going on, they understand the purpose, but you're kind of making all of that very public um, and, and getting your story out there so the community continues to stay informed and continues perhaps to um, grow in terms of it, its excitement and its support for PBL. So what have you seen, um, some strategies for telling the story and 
um, being kind of the, the face to the world for PBL for your district or your school. Well, the story isn't static, right? I mean, uh, when you initiate the program, you have a rationale, you have a why, you have a reason, but uh, but it that evolves and changes. And so I think the story um, uh, needs to be an iterative process that is inclusive of the community. So it's not the school's community, it's the community's, or it's not the school story, it's the community story. Mm -hmm. uh, so by having rich uh, relationships and interactions uh, with all the stakeholders that I mentioned before, that story continues to evolve um, and, uh, and keeps that level of freshness, if you will. Uh, for example, the, the school that I came from is going into its 11th year. And uh, 11 years ago, the needs were very different than they are now. The students are very different, the parents are very different, the community is very different. So by having that strong relationship and by um, sustaining that dialogue with the community re regarding uh, challenges the community faces or needs that the, that, that the, the city has seen, uh, you keep the content fresh uh, in that way. And you know, we can't forget also that our students are our primary stakeholder. So yeah. how are we leveraging them to, to revitalize the program um, or to identify uh, um, uh, powerful or urgent needs that would actually engage them into the content uh, moving forward? Uh, and you know, here's a silly example, but um, the school I came from, we changed, we, ha we changed the mascot every couple of years based off of the culture and character of the school. I mean, it's, it's a sim symbolic gesture, mm -hmm. the iterative nature of the program and how we include students um, in, in, in who we are and who we want to become. Right. So it's it sounds it's a combination of kind of small moments and um, big stories, big story, you know, storytelling uh, writ large. But one example that we share in the book is um, a superintendent school leader from Virginia, Eric Williams, who uses social media really effectively to tell the story of PBL as it's unfolding. Anytime he's doing a classroom walkthrough or sees something great happening, snaps a photo, sends out a tweet, and it's that constant kind of endorsement by the superintendent of this is what learning looks like in our district. And I'm just wondering what other sorts of examples perhaps you're seeing in districts where you do have that culture starting to grow and school leaders who understand the importance of building momentum and uh, keeping the good stories going. Um, you know, what, what have you noticed, what have you seen out there that's working well? Some of the things um, are, are very similar to what Eric has done um, in his districts, you know, making sure that they're, you know, leveraging social media. So I've seen, um, you know, like Knox County just tweeted out something uh, this, this morning, actually, about some of the work that's going on. And, and we've, so we've seen certainly, you know, using social media wisely, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like Twitter, Facebook, but also um, Google Plus communities. Round Rock has a very robust Google Plus community. Um, quite often we'll find that, that our districts make sure that the PBL steering committee has connectivity to whomever their um, information officer or public relations department is. And so we see lots of good news stories, you know, so like local newspapers celebrating student work, um, we think is really important to make sure that the community at large is aware that there are really amazing things happening, you know. Um, we also see um, expos. So we have a, a number of, of our systemic partners that have large public expos to make sure that they're, you know, inviting the community in. Uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools, we think, does a, a really terrific job um, of having a, a public expo that they invite folks like us to. Um, and, and I'm sure that, you know, John and Roddy also have some other examples of, of schools and of systems that are purposeful to invite the community in um, right. to make they get to see the, the good work that's Right. That's and actually, Metro Ma Nashville is one of the districts we um, offer a case study of in the, the leadership chapter, specifically about their um, their expos and how they engage, you know, long term with community um, partners and how expos kind of keep that going. Um, very kind of uh, self-perpetuating cycle uh, when that enthusiasm and share is shared and then when those um, those partners get to come to the expo and see the great work that kids have done as a result of collaborating with experts. So um, really keeps the energy going. And any other um, examples that you've seen, Roddy, that you think are worth passing along? Well, uh, I think we've captured some biggies, but the, the, the important piece is that we're as public as possible, we're as transparent as, as possible about the work that we do. And the reason why, and this came up at least in some of the interviews I did with PBL principals, is that if, if you don't share your, your, your journey, if you don't share your successes and your challenges, uh, then you as a leader in particular must defend the program. 
Mm. And, uh, and not only is that an exhausting and a uh, 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 way you probably don't want to be spending all of your energy, sure. uh, but you're also insulating your staff uh, from, um, you know, from, uh, from, from the wonders and myths and misperceptions that might be going on out there. Uh, so the best way to sustain your work and to celebrate your work and to share your work is by being transparent through social media, through expos, mm -hmm. and by inviting the public to project presentations um, right. yeah. uh, so that we don't have that backslide and so we don't um, use a lot of energy defending uh, your work, but instead showcasing your work. It's a really key point. It's really kind of taking ownership of that message um, <laughs> and, and getting you know kind of your story out there first and foremost seems really important. And I know we have a couple of events coming up. PBL World is coming up um, in Napa in June. And um, Roddy, maybe you could just touch a little bit on um, kind of the leadership strand of that and how events like that can help leadership teams um, develop their capacity and develop this kind of shared leadership um, style. It's going to be really coherent with PBL. Absolutely. And over the years, we've been developing our leadership uh, development workshops. Uh, to build on some of the uh, topics that we've just spoken about over the past half hour. Um, so uh, in the fall of 2015, we're looking at November, November 5th, 5 through 7, uh, we'll be offering another uh, PBL Academy, uh, similar to what we just uh, launched in the fall in Atlanta. And uh, what will be new, and we'll see this at PBL World also, is we'll be offering a PBL uh, Leadership for PBL Basic Strand, so principals, district administrators, site leaders that are new to project-based learning, and an advanced track for principals, site leaders, and district uh, administrators who, um, who have experience with project-based learning and are interested in sustaining that momentum. Um, and also, it's important to note that uh, we uh, offer leadership development a very robust, in-depth series of modules for um, our uh, systemic clients or districts that partner with us uh, for a long, over a long term. Uh, partnership to develop their capacity. Great. Okay. Any any last words from uh, from Jen or from from Roddy? Oh, you want to add? Right. We had some gems of wisdom to share today already. So. All right. Thank you, Susie. Yeah. Thank you, Jen, yeah. and thank you, Roddy. Um, all right. Great stuff, you guys. And there's all that and more in uh, in the chapter. Uh, in the new book from ASCD that I mentioned at the beginning uh, that Susie was a co-author of along with John Mergendoller and myself setting the standard for project-based learning and that will be available uh, June 1st in the BIE.org shop. So, um, hope you enjoyed today's Hangout and um, thanks to our guests. Next week we'll be having uh, another Hangout drawn from the book uh, with some teachers who did projects which we called Spotlight Projects in the book. Susie uh, uh, went around the country and scoured for some great examples of gold standard PBL and so we'll have uh, teachers on the program with us next week uh, from uh, K through 12, some early elementary, uh, middle and high school projects yeah. and we'll hear about those, those projects in the context of gold standard project based learning. Um, and that's all for today then. Thanks very much. Uh, this is available in the archive at BIE.org and um, we'll see you again next week. Uh, it should be June 9th. Same time, noon Pacific, here in California. So, goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.